My name is Renee Wolf, and the final project that I researched is over stuttering. This year, I have two students who stutter, but one of my students has a much more severe stutter than the other. This is the student I based my entire research project on. He is in ninth grade and is actually advanced proficient in math, science, social studies, and reading according to his Iowa assessment results from the 2013-14 school year. He has a severe stutter that impacts his ability to verbally communicate in any size group. He does best when working with a small peer group and when talking to me or other adults, his stutter can get so severe that he actually does become nonverbal and ends up needing to write down his thoughts. He has an IEP that is considered a speech-only IEP for his stuttering. He goes to therapy and meets with the speech and language pathologist regularly. He has three teachers who regularly assess his ability to speak using a fluency rubric. Stuttering is a complex speech impairment that researchers have been analyzing for years. I was not able to find any clear research on why stutters develop. However, I did find some consistencies on when they normally begin. Most stuttering is thought to start around ages two to four. There is some research that found that the presence of a language disorder is more likely to lead to a stutter. Based on this research, when internal and external demands for fluency exceed a child's capacities in one or more areas of development, example, linguistic, cognitive, motor, emotional, stuttering is likely to occur. I also found some interesting findings on motor skills and the link between motor skills and stuttering. A test was done to see if there was links with motor development and language development specifically related to stuttering. Students who were between the ages of four and six were researched. Some of these students had stutters and others did not. Students were asked to clap rhythmically and speak at the same time. This was then related to whether motor skills related to speech impairments like stuttering. The results found that there could be a link in not only speech motor output, but also the possibility of a timing deficit. The authors of the study hypothesized that people who stutter have a general motor deficit or, in some accounts, a timing deficit. After consulting my school district speech and language pathologist, I discovered that when coming up with strategies and activities to help support stuttering, the best first step is through self-assessment. One self-assessment that could be used is a self-evaluation of fluency. The student rates themselves on a one to seven scale on how fluent they are in speech based on specific areas. After this, the same sort of assessment is given to various teachers who hear the students speak on a regular basis. These teacher evaluations are given out on a monthly basis and teachers assess where the students is at as far as fluency. The rating is then recorded and comments are recorded to begin to develop strategies for the student who has the stutter. Another evaluation tool has been used when it comes to working with students who have a stutter is the CALMS assessment tool. This is a self-evaluation tool to be done alongside the special education teacher and speech and language pathologist. It looks at various elements that could impact the student's speech and social encounters. There are five areas that the CALMS strategy looks at. First, cognitive thinking. In the cognitive assessment, the student is assessed on how often he, in the case of the student I, can ident I am talking about, can identify stuttering in oral reading, spontaneous speech, and following a model. The affective feeling questions uh, um, assessment looks at how often the student feels about something when it comes to stuttering. The linguistic or forming the message component looks at when speech begins to turn into a stutter. The motor or producing speech part of the assessment allows a student to identify on a scale what the average degree of stutter is when tension is produced during stuttering moments. And finally, the social or normal communication looks at when stuttering occurs around friends, interactions with others, and whether or not the stutter student avoids speaking in specific situations. There are two activities that I found to use after self-evaluations and teacher evaluations are completed. The first is a relaxation breathing exercise. There are many ways that this can be taught dependent on age. The student that I am working with has a strategy where he puts his hand on his diaphragm to remind himself to slowly release air out of his mouth while talking. Attached to this page is a YouTube video from the American Institute for Stuttering that gives scientific reasoning and rationale for why the diaphragm and breathing exercises are important when working with a stutter. The last strategy that I would provide for the student addressed in this presentation is the fluency rate practice using varied sentence starters. This activity gives a simple sentence and presents it in a PowerPoint 
form using the animation tool on PowerPoint. The sentences appear slowly, very slowly and quickly, and the student has to say them in the order in which the words appear. Thank you for listening to this presentation on stuttering and what materials, activities, and assessments could help aid in, a hel in helping students with a stutter. If you have any questions, feel free to email me.